Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Qatar Goodwood Festival preview. We've got an excellent panel assembled to take you through initially the first couple of days, but casting an eye perhaps over the rest of the week as well. I mentioned an excellent panel alongside me. I'm pleased to introduce the rest of the team. They are David Yates, Daily Mirror Chief Racing Correspondent, Melissa Jones, Daily Express Racing Correspondent, and Racing TV's Andy Stevens. David Yates, I'll start with you if I can. Um, get, get your Weather hat on. Are we going to have a glorious Goodwood or not? I don't think it is going to be glorious, Tom. First of all, let me apologise. I feel slightly underdressed. Uh, I can, I can uh, promise the Duke of Richmond I will be suitably attired uh, come tomorrow afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm in Sussex and have been all weekend. And uh, it's certainly pretty miserable out there. It's very windy and it's quite rainy too. It's certainly... I don't think it's looking out the window. It is raining at the moment. I can uh, exclusively reveal. I'm about probably. That's the live hour. weather updates we bring you on on this show. That's that's yeah. we were taking you to the heart of the action. I'm probably an hour away, in truth, from uh, Goodwood, but it's yeah, you know, it'll. I think we'll be looking at giving the ground. You know, a horse like Blue Rose Sen, for example, who I think it's fair to say her stellar performances have come with give, then. There won't be any excuses for her, I don't think, in the, the Nassau on Thursday on account of the ground. I think it's going to be a, a pretty mixed bag of weather, but I don't think it's going to be Lingfield, uh, sorry, linen suits and, and, and Panamas throughout the week. Uh, let me just give you a, a little latest on the going currently as we stand, which is 24 hours away. We've gone to good to soft, soft in places currently. Could be a bit more rain around uh, today and possibly a little bit tomorrow evening as well. But the first day looks um, set to stay pretty dry, which is good news. Melissa Jones from the Daily Express, what does glorious Goodwood mean to you? Well, it's a fantastic week, isn't it, Tom, with the best of the best taking each other on across the generations as Dave said, unfortunately, we're not going to be blessed with some lovely weather this week. It's edging on a jumper territory almost, isn't it? Really a chilly as the inclement weather has sort of descended on the UK over the past few weeks. So unfortunately, it is going to be a bit damp and gloomy. Once the weather sets in at Goodwood, it sort of hangs around a little bit. But of course, the race in action will, will light up the week. And we've got loads of different horses to, to start during the week so it's really exciting to see you know how, how they're how they're going to fare and uh, of course we've got Paddington on, on show he's a real stalwart of, of the flat racing scene and uh, plenty of competitive races regardless of the going sort of to get our teeth into and yeah hopefully we'll get some winners as, as we go along. Well well fingers crossed and the team are going to help with that including Andy we just need to avoid the the Goodwood hard luck stories Andy how do we best go about that? Indeed, maybe soft ground will help with that. You know, if you get fast ground there, you get more compacted fields. Softer ground, you know, the horses can spread out a bit more, can't we? So we might get a bit more room to manoeuvre. Good news for us punters. I mean, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad choices of clothing, isn't there? Really, that's the, that's the bottom line. And the West Indies, they call rain liquid sunshine. So, you know, let's be positive and upbeat here. And rather than this negative kind of start to the show. You can... You can you can call it liquid sunshine when you're surrounded by 30 degree weather that's that then it can be yeah but uh but not so if it's chilly um right we're in the main going to be getting stuck into tuesday and wednesday and starting in each case with the the, the top action on each day so obviously the goodwood cup uh, the Al Shakab Goodwood Cup and, and then the Sussex Stakes as well. Uh, let's turn our attention to the, the Goodwood Cup. It takes place at 4.35 on an eight race card on Tuesday at Goodwood. Uh, I suppose the, the slight disappointment that Courage Monomy and Gregory weren't both declared in the colours of Wathnan Racing, uh, which means we've got a clear favourite with um, Courage Monami. Around about a five to two shot and half a point shorter than Coltrane, who finished second to the horse at Ascot last time. Andy, I'll, I'll come straight back to you. Does this race centre around Courage Mon Ami? I think it has to, doesn't it? I mean, that was that was a tremendous effort, Ascot. Fourth run of its life, went into it rated 106. I I don't think he'd, he'd have the experience or the, or the know-how to, to win there. But um, clearly, you know, he's, a, he's on a very steep trajectory, isn't he? Um, he's been gelded this horse as well, so we're going to see an awful lot more of him over the years. We're watching him here win at uh, Goodwood, the handicap before before Royal Ascot, so he's got um, got some experience of the track. He's a top horse. He's the one to beat. Um, 
the, the one unknown factor with him would be that would be the softer ground. Um, it's by Frankel, so you, you you know they seem to go on just about everything. But I think if you if, you know that's the one niggle you'd have, um, and, and maybe Royal Ascot has it left any kind of mark on, on the horse. We don't know. We don't know enough about the horse overall. But um, no, he's a very worthy favourite and the one to beat. Dave, speaking to Oshin Murphy yesterday on on Racing TV on, on Luck on Sunday, he felt that at Ascot he had a bit of a target on his back um, and, and really gave almost inadvertently Frankie something to aim at. I wonder if he'll be sort of almost trying a role reversal coming into the race tomorrow. Yeah, I'm sure he will. And I think that um, the connections of Coltrane will pin their hopes on the, the two-mile trip as well. Uh, you know, they, they might feel, I know that that seems a, a daft thing to say about a, a horse who's won the Ascot Stakes and obviously he's won the, um, a, a Doncaster Cup as well. But they might feel that, well, I think Asheen Murphy feels and uh, I think Mick Mariscotti, the, the part owner with his wife Janice, feels the same way, that if, if they can reverse uh, that three-quarter length beating uh, with Courage Mon Ami, then the trip will help. I personally think that Courage Monami is going to be very hard to beat here. There was, as you say, there was a bit of uncertainty as to whether Gregory, another unbeaten uh, Vathnan Racing, John Gosden, Royal Ascot winner, was going to run, or Courage Monami. Uh, they've decided to go with the, the Gold Cup winner. I don't think that, you know, the, the advance that he made from that Goodwood handicap to win one of the you know, signature staying prizes of the flat racing season, I thought was immense. I don't think coming back in, in trip will be a problem. Uh, he's won at Goodwoods. As Andy said, we don't really know about the ground, but he's by Franklin. It'd be a surprise if, you know, good to soft, softish ground proved an Achilles heel for him. And I think he's going to be very hard to beat. You know, we, we know that by dint of being, or not we know, but we, we one would suspect that by dint of being more lightly raced than uh, Coltrane, he's got some uh, the, the greater uh, scope for, for further improvement. And I think he's going to be very hard to beat. The, the horse that I thought at bigger prices who might be interesting uh, would be Lone Eagle. He, he travelled well in the Gold Cup. He faded in the straight to finish ninth. We know that he was a top-class horse when he was trained by the Meads. Uh, now with Rafe Beckett, he was unraced beyond a mile and five before he went up to two and a half at Royal Ascot. And if we split the difference, uh, the two miles might be the, the Goldilocks's porridge, if you like, for um, uh, for Lone Eagle. And I thought he was interesting at bigger prices, but I think Courage Monami will probably win. Round about 20 to one, Lone Eagle. Uh, Melissa, the easiest question of the lot for you, who wins? Well, I actually like Eldar Eldarov uh, to, to throw him into the mix. Uh, obviously, the St. Ledger winner, and he won that with ease in the ground. Um, and Gio Valletto was behind that day. And Emily Dickinson, he met Gio Valletto uh, earlier in the season when he tried to give him five pounds. And I think he was a little bit rusty that day. He, um, he it was still a, a credi credible run, nevertheless. And then he ran in the Gold Cup, of course, um, disappointed on that occasion behind Courage Monami. And of course, you have to take a leap of faith to support him that the fact he's going to overturn the reigning Gold Cup champion. But um, he's drawn wide, and I think he's a horse that likes to race on the outside of the field. Uh, he, he's that horse that comes with a nice, you know, late, relentless sort of run. And I can see him sort of rolling down the hill. It's a good one, you know, picking up that momentum. And hopefully staying on on really well at the finish. I just don't think he stayed at, at Ascot. And you can just put a line through that run. But he's a very classy animal. And, it, of course, his form does tie in with several of these. The favourite is rock solid. The one thing I would say about him is the last, uh, in the closing stages of his Gold Cup triumph, um, he did show quite a lot of pace inside the, the final few furlongs. So that is a question mark, perhaps, about the, the ground. Um, but that, of course, would be sort of the only real negative because, uh, as uh, Dave and Andy say, he, he has a, an excellent profile and favourites have an excellent record in this race. So, yeah, he is hard to fault, but I am uh, hoping Elder Elderov will be sweeping down the outside and, and really relish the two miles in this race. OK, I'm going to back um, Enemy, outsider of the bunch, who I think wants to be fresh. And if you ignore the last couple of runs, 66 to 1 is a bit of an insulting price. 
Um, Mel, just to, to come back to you then, obviously, I, I guess the, the Lennox is, is all about Kinross, who won it a couple of years ago, just touched off last year, around about a six to four shot. Um, and, and the Vintage Stakes has got some hugely exciting two-year-olds. Which race are you most looking forward to? Well, the Lennox, actually. I'm drawn to Al Sahail, trained by Charlie Appleby, who took this a couple of years ago with Space Blues. He does have to turn around form with Kinross, the horse he finished just ahead of at Royal Ascot. But I think down to today's, to, to Tuesday's trip will really suit him. And uh, I think he, he's a decent prize. I think, obviously, with the Tory on board, Kim Ross is, takes a big chunk out of the market. But Al Sahel will love the trip. The ground should be fine. And he's a really classy animal on his day. And I just think, given that the yard have won the Space, Space Blues a couple of years ago, that uh, this is his real big day to shine. Yes, my love-hate relationship with Elsa Hale continues aplenty. Mainly hate, to be honest, um, but I rarely get him right. But he's hugely talented. Andy Stevens, over to you. I'm exactly the same with Elsa Hale, Tom. Every time <laughs> I back Elsa Hale, it gets stuffed. And every time I don't back him, he wins. He, he, he's, he's a bit of an enigma, isn't he? He's he's very interesting. I did think Kinross is is clearly very hard to beat on a, you know all-known form. He's got his ground. Um, very tough. Uh Won it two years ago. Really should have won last year as well. Frankie just got trapped. Um, just he had to wait for the cutaway to get a run. He sort of lost a couple of lengths, flying at the finish. Didn't quite get up. So he, he could easily be going for a third successive win in the race. Um, and I, I came close to supposing with Al Sahel. And then I look back at the park stakes at Doncaster last year where Kinross had him behind. And he's actually six pounds better off uh, on um, uh, tomorrow as well. So... Um, yeah, K- Kinross, bit bit boring, I'm afraid, but there we are. We have we can have a Frankie flying dismount in in the rain. What 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 can we what more can we ask for? Yeah, yeah. If he if he goes great guns like he did at Ascot, it'll be a great atmosphere there. Davy Yates, uh, vintage or or Lennox? What do you want to talk about? Uh, we can talk about both if you like, Tom. Uh, I agree with Melissa about Iberian um, in the vintage stakes. Uh, as as she said, you've got high heel there. That, um, the, the dam also is a half-sister to just the judge, of course, who Charlie Hill's cha- uh, trained to victory in the Irish 1000 Guineas. Um, I think it was hard not to be taken by that Newbury debut of Iberian, cost two, 200,000 uh, quid as a yearling. And I think that there's a huge upside to this horse. I'd be happy to uh, take the chance that um, the softer ground wouldn't be a problem. And I, I think he must surely go very well. Um the Lennox Stakes, it definitely revolves around Kinross. Um, the, I, I felt with Kinross that uh, if he's going to win a, a big race or, or a Group 1 over six, then he probably needs cut in the ground to do that, which, of course, he had when he won the champion sprint at Ascot last October. And bearing that in mind, I think that run in the July Cup was a really good one. Uh, because the ground was quicker that day. Um, going back up to seven, which I think up until recently anyway, has been his sort of specialist distance. That will definitely be an advantage to him. He's got previous in this race, as we know, and I think it'd be very hard to be. I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to throw in at the prices Isaac Shelby, though. Um, I think that uh, when he won the... Uh, the Greenham, obviously, we were all writing about the horse that finished without a jockey, Chaldean. But his form subsequent to that, he was overhauled late on with giving the ground in the Pool de C des Poulains at Longchamp. It, it was a below expectations or, or a slightly below par run on quicker terrain in the St. James's Palace behind Paddington. I don't think coming back to seven will be a problem at all. I think the rain softened ground is definitely a plus too. And I think there's more improvement to come uh, from Isaac Shelby. So I, I, I'm, I, I haven't written uh, my copy on that race yet, but I think I'm inclined to throw in Isaac Shelby against Kin Ross, who's going to be a very popular horse tomorrow, isn't he? Um, as Andy said, there's the prospect of the flying dismount, uh, De Tori, a horse who um, punters will side with horses with, with previous at Goodwood, I think he'll go pretty go off pretty short. I think he'll probably win, but at the prices, I'd be inclined just to throw in Isaac Shelby. All right, just quickly on Iberian. Sorry, sorry, just quickly on Iberian. Don't be put off by the fact that he's only just won the maiden, whereas some of the other horses have been in group company. The 
the, uh, they come very, very close to running that horse in the Chesham first time out. He's got a very big reputation at home. They're very excited about the horse. He, he was in the superlative as well and then taken out. Yeah. Uh, on, on account of the ground, I think. But it did go very... There was a load of rain that day. Um, right, rolling on to Wednesday then. The 3.35 is the Qatar Sussex Stakes. Uh, that is the feature, of course. And Paddington, well, now we know he's not going to be taking on Nostrum, is twos on. Um, Melissa, where, where, where do you stand on, on Paddington? Penalty kick for him or, or could it be a bit trickier? Well, it should be, shouldn't it? I mean, we've got the horse here that's come from Handicap Company, you know, to the Irish 2000 Guineas, to St. James's Palace. And of course, um, a tough, impressive victory in the Eclipse last time out. Uh, he, he's not going to be at any price, of course. Um, but he, he's very hard to fault, isn't he? A horse that's uh, risen through the ranks in such imperious fashion, uh, travels smoothly. And, you know, he got the job done, really, with the minimum of fuss last time. Um, he's just a really solid, classy performer. Uh, I guess the only niggling doubt really would, you know, it's another another top-level race, um, at, you know, coming fairly quick, isn't it? Um, but he, he, he does sort of, you know, he seems to have sort of plenty in hand when he does win his races. Um, There's always holding Emily up, John, there. And um, he, he's got you know, a bit in hand on the ratings, of course, which is reflected in his price. And we've had really good winners of this race previously, haven't we? Of course, Frankel starred in it at Kingman. Uh, and now, you know, this horse with this rock solid group one profile, uh, he's come through his first test of, of tackling the older horses last time out. And yeah, as I said, the odds reflect his solid chance here. Andy, Dave, come on, give me give me some negativity about Paddington. There's got to be some chinks in the armour, something. Yeah, well, at the risk of everyone switching off the podcast and saying, "Look at, listen to these guys; they're just tipping all the favourites." Kin Ross, Paddington. What am I watching this show? I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll take Paddington on. I mean, two's on. The thing that the thing that's really odd about this is that there's six runners. There's not a pace. There's not a front runner or anything that goes near the pace there. Now, in the old days, Ballydor would always give themselves a, a safety blanket of a, of a pacemaker in there. So if they wanted something to set a pace, they would have him there. If they didn't, you know, if they didn't worry worried about the pace, they, the pacemaker would be there, but just play a negligible kind of um, a, a small role in the race. They could have easily had just something in there to to tee this race up for for Paddington. You know, a horse that clearly gets a mile well gets ten furlongs well. Now we're looking at the prospect of a muddling kind of sprint from three furlongs out. So I don't think he's the kind of horse that Ryan Moore would kick out and make all on. I think he's a horse that wants to doesn't want to be in front too long on him. Um, it's his sixth run of the year. It's his fourth quick group one race of the year. He was a non-runner on the soft ground as a two-year-old. They pulled him out because of the ground. Uh, I know he's, he's got four months off subsequently. Just just small little things like that. Would I certainly wouldn't be um, an insurance job at, at, at two's on. Um, I'd, I'd take him on with the, with the French horse who's completely slipped under the, under the radar. Fact, factor Cheval. Um, I mean, he's five wins last year. I must admit, passed me by. But his last run in the, in the pre-Ispahan, I'd urge anyone to go back and look at that on YouTube because he finished, it was a blanket finish uh, with Anne Matt, who um, is held in very high regard. And um, the second horse, let me just look at my notes. It was the uh, sorry, Light Infantry, of course, who gives us a steer on his, his, his gauge of ability. He finished upside then, but watch the race because he... He absolutely pulled his head off for, um, for, for about six furlongs of, of the race. Gerald Musso's got his lovely magic white gloves. Even his magic white gloves could not hold that horse. Um, he, he just tanked through the race and done way too much, but was still involved in the finish. Now, equally, you could say a muddling pace um, on Wednesday isn't going to help him um, if he's going to be behave like that. He's got form over further. If I was... Um, if, if I was connected with that horse, I'd say, look, just let him bowl along. If we can just get him settled in front and then um, kick from there, might just might just be able to pinch things. I'll just finish up by saying if it's genuinely soft ground, I'll probably have a bit on Aldari, who was absolutely hammered in the betting last time and maybe just hadn't gone soft enough at Ascot. But that would have to it would have to be genuinely soft ground. We also have the Mulcombe stakes, we've got the Oak Tree stakes, Dave Yates. Do you have a, any official selections in either of those races for us? I, I don't, I'm afraid, Tom. I I just in terms of the uh the Mulcombe, I mean the the horse that 
I'd have been interested against uh, the favourite Killian would be um, the uh, the Windsor Castle winner, Big Evs. Is that, yeah. how you, is that how, I'm sorry, I don't even know how to pronounce a Royal Ascot winner's name. Is that how you pronounce that, Big Evs? Oh, I think pretty sure. I don't, yeah, I think it's Big yeah. EVS. Yeah, yeah. The, I, 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 I'm sorry to say that in when you're at well, when I'm at Royal Ascot, a lot of the so-called shoulder races um, pass me by because you're you're reporting on the group ones and looking at news stories and all the rest of it. And and that was one. But um, he was really impressive in winning that. That the the Achilles' heel for him could be rain, soft, and ground. He's by Blue Point who. I think it's fair to say that his signature performances came on quicker terrain. Um, and it's obviously going to be, uh, we, we, you know, however soft it's going to be, it's we're going to have given the ground. It's clearly not going to be rattling fast. But I thought he was interesting, really, with uh, regards uh, to that race. He's around uh, about 11 to 4 compared to the 2 to 1 about Killian. Melissa. Yeah, Killian's at the head of at the head, ugh, can't speak at the head of the market, isn't he, for this for the Malcolm? Um, I'm not convinced he's going to really be in love with the the ground. Uh, if you look at his action at at Sandown, obviously it was a really fluent win. Um, I just I think perhaps maybe he might find the wheel spinning here, um, and I think at a short price he he might be one to take on. Of course, a couple of years ago we saw how armour for Richard Hannon. Uh, who's won the last couple of renewals of this? That he won really well, and he's represented by Bahir in this this year's renewal. So he he's got to be respected. I just thought a, a really big price. Um, Hackman takes uh, takes the eye. Uh, of course, he's he's fairly exposed as a two year old, and he does have he does have ground to make up on Killian from his last run. But he's got four months soft. He he won well earlier in the season on on the going, and of course he's got Tom Mark and up who. Is worth an extra couple of pounds in in the saddle. Um, I just thought that an each way price. You know, we've got the the eight runners here. I thought that he he's you know a, a value bet. Um, like I say, he ticks a couple of the boxes, and um, of course he's not as classy as some of these. But um, I just think that the, the ones at the head of the market they've they've got grand queries, and um, the other one I quite liked was that the balding horse at Puro Sangue, is that how you say it? Um, he, he, oh, sangue, yes. Yeah, it's, it's Italian for thoroughbred. Ah, excellent. Oh, what knowledge, Dave. <laughs> Superb. But he's, uh, yeah, he was a, a good winner on debut, wasn't he? And then, um, for, for whatever reason, didn't fire last time out. So he'd be up there as, a, as an each way play as well. I just think um, Killian's uh, one to take on, you know, blistering speed on, on his last run. And uh, Big Evs obviously does have to prove for. Uh, his ascot form, uh, of course, he was really um, a good winner of, of of his assignment there. So, um, yeah, the, the top two, they're very good. But as I said, the, the going brings a question mark for them and you've got plausible alternatives. I had to hear that language thing, Tom, because my, my, my summary of the race was so poor. <laughs> listen, you redeemed you're yourself. Here for, you're here for local weather reports and any Italian translations we need. So that's fine. That's, that's 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 the requirement. Uh, I was only, I, it was something about a Ferrari, wasn't it? This boarding horse. Is it the same? Is it one and the same? I don't know. My Italian, um, right? It will be because Ferrari oh, has a has a has a horse on the front, and it's Italian. Cavallo yeah. Rampante. Uh, yeah, so they clearly think it's a Ferrari. I mean, yeah, could be. Maybe maybe you, need, you might need something different by Wednesday afternoon, but um, maybe a four by four Range Rover or something might be more. More, more applicable. What's yeah? If, he, if he's turning out the back, what's the Italian for Skoda? Anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, Bahir was described by Richard Hannon as um, a, about the best juvenile at home he's ever trained. And when he was beaten on his first start, he said, "You could have knocked me over with a feather." He was very impressive on his second start. I don't know what Bahir we're going to get, but if he's anything like last time, I thought he was a big price at eleven to one. Andy Stevens. Yeah, no, I'd echo that, Tom, because I think Richard said that this horse has been doing doing stuff that no two year old has, has ever done with him before. This this bit here, so obviously there's a lot of horses that work fantastic at home and don't always bring it to the race course. But he did look very good, didn't he, at Newbury last time? I did actually like Big. I did I did like Big, Big Evs, um, you know, to win the Windsor Castle in the manner that he did. Very decisive at the finish there. The form is is working out pretty well. A couple of horses, the also rounds have, have run either one. Or ran well in listed races since then, 
think he sets the standard, but we're going to be guessing, aren't we, as to, as to the ground. You know, um, these two yards, we're basing it mostly on fast ground. They're going to be, I think they're going to be racing on soft, sort of tacky ground on, on Wednesday. Andy, Andy, what do you feel about the ground with with this horse? Because I, I think that if if it were good ground, I'd, I'd, well, if he were if it were good ground, I think it'd be shorter anyway. Mm. But that's the one thing that does put me off with this horse. I think he's easily, he's, he, I think he's a really, um, he's a really good sprint two year old, and he's got a lot more to offer. But it's just that the blue points on rain softened ground. I know it's it's relatively early days, but that does worry me slightly. It, he won. He did. He won a Group Three on um, on Rain Soft and Ground Blue Point. Was it the like the Bengoff Stakes or something like that? But he made his name, didn't he, on quicker ground? And yeah, sure. Uh, I haven't looked at the distaff the side. I must have big I'll have a, I'll have a closer look at the at the dam side as well. See if there's any uh, any encouragement from from the from the, from the relatives there. But I, I guess we have to trust the the trainers and the connections, don't we? There's plenty of options for them to go forth, and they're happy to to run. Then we'll have to we'll have to go with them. One thing that was definitely notable, notable about Big Evs was that there was quite a lot of support of big prices around and a few very happy people in the winner's enclosure afterwards. So, um, yeah, I think a few people did rather well out of that success. OK, Thursday, we are going to touch loosely upon, I, I guess it mainly centres around Nashua, but I guess if there's a duel on the downs, it's it's kind of Nashua um, against Blue Rose Sen. Fantastic that, that, that she's heading over. Nashua, Andy... Proved herself over a mile last time, probably potentially a career best on, on that occasion. But no concern, I guess, coming back here to defend her crown. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't imagine so, Tom. She was right back on her A game, wasn't she? There and um, obviously won, won the race last year. She's she's very very solid, isn't she? With the, with the French filly, we don't quite know. I mean, it's been more style than than substance. The form that the horse that uh, Blue Ace um, that she beat last time, uh, Never Ending Story. She she subsequently has run twice against the older horses and been beaten out of sight. Um, clearly very good. The other, the other worry I'd have with, with the French filly is obviously the jockeys has got no, um, never ridden at Goodwood, um, never ridden a, a, a winner in Britain. I mean, the horse might be good enough to, to get him out of trouble, but it's, uh, as John Gosden said today, it's an ex eccentric course. So that's just something to, to, to throw in the, in, in the, in the pot as well. But I think, Melissa, they're going to ride her pretty cold again, as was the case last year. Um, this is Nashua. I guess um, we, we don't know the draw yet. My, my one concern would be I uh, price relative, of course. I wouldn't really want her drawn very low because Holly Doyle might have to just do a little bit more work to to switch her out. But that's probably that's that's probably you know trying to pick holes in her when when that isn't necessary. Yeah, Nashua. She was very good last time, wasn't she? Uh, prior to that, met Al Husson. Um, on the all weather and and I, I believe uh, she's going to be taking her on again I was chatting to Roger Varian earlier this, early this week for for a piece um a, a sort of best bets for, for from trainers sort of piece it's going to be in the, in the paper this week uh, and we were just chatting about Al Huss and the way that um they really don't know you know what's under the bonnet with her really she's just does enough um in, in victory a bit like Hookham of course uh, in in the same ownership so um, she, she's definitely an interesting contender if she lines up again against Nashua. Of course, Nashua's raised the bar again, hasn't she, from her last win? And um, of course, a tremendous partnership with Holly Doyle, and uh, she obviously knows her knows her so well, and, and has been instrumental to to her career. You know, they're a, a great duo, aren't they? Um, of course, tackling Blue Rose Sen, um, who travels over. I, I don't think I think Andy touched on the you know the, the jockey. Um, the fact that he hasn't ridden at Goodwood before, and um, for me, I'd, I'd, I don't think that that would be a negative because he he knows that the filly so well, and um, I think she's she's extremely classy. And uh, of course, Christopher Head, a fifth generation trainer from the family, um, he wouldn't be travelling over if uh, you know he didn't think she'd be in with an absolute you know belting chance of, of winning and, and trying to replicate uh, his father's success with Solo, who. Uh, one here a, a, a fair few years ago, and um, yeah, they, they don't travel without reason, do they? And hopefully that they hope that uh, they'll have the edge over Nashua. But yeah, it's a definitely an, a really interesting head to head here. Um, there won't be too much between them, but um, I I would sort of prefer. Well, my my vote would be with with the French filly and uh, Al Husson, I think can 
she does have the raw ability to to shake the the top two up. It just depends really sort of how the race pans out. As you say, Tom, what draw they get, and um, tactically it should be very interesting with them. Um, the, the French jockey is the newcomer to, to Goodwood, where where he's going to sit, and um, I'm sure Holly will um, be sort of tracking his every move and uh, hoping to take advantage. Dave, I'm I'm rather caught out by it. I'm just checking the prices. Blue Rose send eleven to ten, Nashua two to one. I, I didn't think there'd be that much between them. Over to you. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think that um, if if I had to choose between the two, I would go with Blue Rose Sen. But I agree with you that I I, I thought they would be you know almost joint favourites. Um, I think it's interesting this race because. I don't think this necessarily is a duel on the downs. Um, Melissa has, has talked about Al Husn, who, as we know, beat Nashua at Newcastle. And I think Melissa with with Roger Varian, they she's a, she's one of those horses that's genuinely surprised them, isn't she? That that if you'd said to you know we know that we know that 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 yard generally they know their swans from their geese, don't they? And it's interesting. I thought maybe you can confirm this that if you said to Roger Varian earlier in the year this horse will be contesting the Nassau Stakes at Glorious Goodwood Qatar Goodwood Festival um, at the start of August he would probably have said that that would be a huge surprise to him. Yeah, I think it would have been, um, and and she's just a, a, a filly that just she just steps up, doesn't she? It's, she only sort of beats what's put in front of her narrowly and those horses are really hard to gauge aren't they you know like yeah. I said a bit like Hookham and you just don't really know quite what's there and and as Roger said to me earlier in the week you know it's a really exciting really exciting horse to have uh, going into this race where the, the talk is dominated by uh, Blue Rose Sen and Nashua but um, yeah Al Husson's there in the background and uh, she, she does have, have the credentials to, to figure strongly. Because Paddington's another one of those, isn't he? You know, let's be honest about it. I know that um, Aidan O'Brien will say, oh, we always thought this horse was a good horse. And the fact that he ran in a handicap, we shouldn't um, read too much into that. But generally, Ballydoyle find stakes races for their classic aspirants, don't they? But anyway, to, to go back to the Nassau, um, what about Running Lion? I, I thought that, obviously, the, the sheen has come off her profile hasn't it over the last month or so that there was the stalls incident at uh, Epsom during the Oaks she was disappointing she's got you know she's got a fair way to make up on Blue Rose Seine from their running in the Prix de Diane at Chanty. Um David Redvers said that she was panting like a dog afterwards and that they felt that something wasn't quite right that she sort of overheated now I know that connections can give sometimes excuses that seem spurious, almost laughable. But if there's any um, if there's any weight in that, then when Running Lion won the Pretty Polly Stakes at Newmarket on rain softened ground, which she will very likely get this week, she was a single figure price for the the, the Phillies Classics. I think most of us probably thought that a mile and a half would stretch her and that 10 furlongs might be her um, her optimum trip. We didn't get the chance to see that in the Oaks because of what happened in the stalls. And then she was just disappointing at Shanti. But I think if you forgive that, then at double, double figure odds, I, I think she's still got plenty of upside. And, you know, of course, we're likely to try and boil this down to two horses. But I think that it's not as simple as that. Al Husn is certainly one, and I'd certainly put Running Lion in as, as another. I'd just like to open up um, the, the the rest of the week to anyone. If there's anything uh, that that people are desperate to get out there, I would. Um, I, I wanted to give a mention to Mum's Tipple if he goes to the Stewards Cup, and obviously the draw we don't know yet, but I think he is an ideal candidate for that race, around about a twenty to one shot. Anything else for the rest of the week? Anyone? You don't have to. I could throw in a couple. Um, Go on. I thought that a dream composer in uh, the first race tomorrow, um, horse with a really good um, record at, at, at Goodwood. I think that rain softened ground certainly won't be a problem. And there, there are a few sort of um, 
there are a few horses with previous both at the meeting and at uh, the track. Obviously, uh, the favourite Razzle is one. Uh, when the dealing's done is another. But I, I thought that Dream Composer would run well in that. And the other horse I just thought was is worth sticking with, despite um, a uh, defeat at, at York last time, and that is Bleak of William Haggis. is a horse who runs in the colours of uh, James Wigan. And uh, Bleak made the running at York and was then... Uh, actually, w w was was overhauled uh, and and split two hold up horses that day. Um, Bleak's got entries both on uh, Thursday and on Friday. One is the Kingsham Handicap, which uh, which commemorates that great mare who won the uh, the Goodwood Cup in the the eighteen seventies. But I, she's lightly raced. I think she's got more in, improvement to come. I wouldn't really be fussed whether she ran over 10 or 11 furlongs. I think the, the Kingston race is over 11 furlongs on the Thursday and the, the Coral Handicap is the other race. It's over 10, I think, on the Friday. But I thought Bleak would be interesting um, if, if, if running at the meeting, but certainly as a, a horse, I think has got a, a, a bright future and um, dream composer in the opener tomorrow dream composer uh around about an eight to one shot uh shorter than that top of the market i think it is one for you melissa who'd have thought that the the, the five following an opener at goodwood would get such attention but who do you like we're hoping to start the meeting with a bang aren't we you know <laughs> flying in with a, a winner hopefully to to kick off the week uh it's pretty unoriginal but i like Russell, of course um loves goodwood uh, back in handicap company i'm told he's due to run twice at the meeting this week. So uh, they'll be hoping to to kick off with a win. He's edged down the handicap a little bit. And we know in these races over this, the shorter distances, a, a few pounds can help either side. And, and he, yeah, as we know, course form is so important at Goodwood. So Russell to, to kick off the week. And then Elsa Hale, as previously mentioned, um, most of his wins have come at seven furlongs. Uh, but the draw does make it slightly trickier for William Buick. So it'll be interesting to see if he can just slot in. But um, again, likes to go forward. Um, but the ground's no worry. Um, if he gets a really good position, I can see him I can see him taking taking the race on Tuesday. Um, but later in the week, um, going for an outsider in the Stewards Cup, um, Archie Watson's Albashir, I find quite interesting. Still unexposed in, in sprints, of course, ran in the Wokey and won by stable mate St. Lawrence, who I believe connections are um, pondering a, a trip to France with that horse. So uh, he is one of the favourites at the, the anti-post stage. So Al Bashir catches the eye. He ran the Dewhurst as a two-year-old. Uh, obviously, his career hasn't hit the heights that they thought it, it once might, but uh, unexposed in handicaps, uh, back to sprinting, has got the headgear on, and um, he's around about a 14-to-1 shot at, at the moment. And... Um, Things just haven't worked out for him this season, but um, I think if, if things drop right, then um, he could go well at a price. But uh, yeah, um, Russell and Elsa Hale to to start the meeting, hopefully with a, a couple of winners there. Andy Stevens, your two or more. We should we should have we should have compared notes, shouldn't we, beforehand? I mean, I can't believe it. I've gone for I've gone for a horse in the, in the very first five furlong handicap as well. Um, if I'd known that Mel and Dave were much better judges than me, are also going to play in that race, I'd have stood down from the table. Um, I've gone for Lord. Race in my case, go on. <laughs> I, I fancy Lord Ridderford to, to land the hat oh. trick in, in that first race. He's he's won it the last two years. He's a grey. He comes flying through from off the pace. Doesn't care what the ground is like. Clearly, it's all. This is his cup final. Somehow they've managed to get this horse on a lower rating this year than he has been for either of his two wins. Um, and I've noticed that he was, I think it was initially 11 to 1. He's now down to 8, 9 to 1. I can see him being very popular when people putting two and two together with him. So, Lord Ridderford in, in the first. Uh, Wednesday, yes, persist um, in the 10 furlong uh, Phillies handicap, 4.45 on, on Wednesday. She's by Frankel. She's out of persuasive. Uh, fan fantastic pedigree and clearly a pedigree that won't mind soft ground either. I thought last year she was just, just something of a work in progress. Never seemed to get to the bottom of her really. I followed her very, very closely then. Um, first time out this year, she ran at Newcastle. Absolutely just walked out of the stalls, had no chance after that. And I think it was just a case after that of um, 
I'm just getting a run under her belt. At least she's she's got the gas out of her that way. She's obviously going to have to break better, but she's running off. I think 86. She's just. It could just be a very lenient mark, and I think she actually will enjoy a first go on soft ground. That that'll help her. She's always been strong at the finish of her races. Um, I think that'll 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 suit her. And I'll also throw in um, one for Thursday, and that is he said just quickly looking at his notes. A uh, perfuse uh, of Sir Michael Stout, who last time was well fancied for the King George handicap at Royal Ascot was exposed to that unbelievable suicidal pace where they were going sort of five furlong fractions early on. He still hung in there, travelled like an absolute dream, and then it, it found him out just towards the finish. Um, they're actually dropping him back in trip to 10 furlongs here. I mean, he's a good horse. He's definitely he's definitely well handicapped to win races. I think he'll end up being a, a, a pattern horse in time. I think he's about six to one for that on, on Thursday. Um, and then the woke, and we should also mention as well, shouldn't we, Highfield Princess, the um, the King George on Friday should be or, or a bit of a lap of honour for her. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the Stewards Cup on Saturday, which we've all managed to dodge at this stage. So um, I'll be going with um, a, a Razio, who I backed in the um, for the Wokingham, uh, finished sixth. He's got to turn the, the tables and a few in front of, uh, that finished in front of him. But um, I think the softer ground will definitely help him. He'd been very progressive on, on slower surfaces before that. All right, and my two. I'm also got one in the opener. Oh, no, I don't. That would just be. <laughs> You'd have gone through the field if you had. Yeah, imagine <laughs> if we didn't find the winner. Uh, I'm going to back Soto Sizzler in the ten furlong race. Uh, is a is a chunky old price, and I think has been kept off since Epsom intentionally to come back for this race. Is a is a course winner over further. Uh, ran in this race last year and was seven pound higher. Didn't really run much of a race, but. He was challenging completely the wrong part of the track last time and still ran really well. You wanted to be on the speed and on the rail, the near side rail at Epsom. He was off the speed down the middle of the track and still ran a great race. Ryan Moore book for Father Gary. Thought he was particularly interesting. And the other one is Bahir, who I've given a strong mention to already in, in the Mulcom. I think he's a, a, a rock solid, very talented juvenile and a fair old price based upon that really good performance at Newbury last time. Question mark is that... Yeah, I guess he was a bit disappointing on the face of it on debut. And I've um, already mentioned Mum's tipple for the for the Stewards Cup. If he runs, hopefully he does. All right. A chance to indulge a little bit now and, and give you some personal Goodwood highlights. We had a bit of a set two, Andy, as to who we were going for. You let me have Frankel, so I, I want to thank you for that. And you can take it away with yours, first of all. Oh, well, he was magnificent, wasn't he, Frankel? That, especially that first one. It was just, it was just wonderful. But now you can, you can have him. I'll, I'll turn the clock back twenty five years um, for, for, for double trigger. The gorgeous. I was, I'm a sucker for the stars. He was a wonderful um, staying horse in, 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 in the sort of mid nineties and late nineties. This, this one we're watching now. This was his third win in ninety eight. And uh, three furlongs out, I think um, Aussie Jim McGrath said, and double trigger can't can't find anymore. And he did look; he was under the pump. He dropped back to fourth, and he thought, "Well, that's the old boy. You know, it's it's been great, great having you, and you know, come home safe." But then you could almost see him just sort of take a deep breath and roll up his sleeves and think, "No, come on, I'll have, a, I'll have another crack at this." And he just stayed on like an absolute lion that day. And and, and I remember that the scenes afterwards were just just fantastic. You know, just to see no horse had done that at the time. Um, of course, Stradivarius come along and, and blew him away after that. But he, he travelled all around the world. I mean, he ran in a Melbourne. He, you know, he was here, here, there, and everyone. He won an Italian St. Ledger as a, as a younger horse. Um, he was a triple crown winner at 95. But that, that 98 win was just great because it was just like the old boy, um, you know, one final hurrah. He did go on again and win the Doncaster Cup, Cup after that as well. And then and then um, that, that was his lot. But um, no, fan fantastic memories. Who who was the 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 rider? I don't know. Standing up in the irons, then. Well, it's Tara Horn. They they switched him that year. They they decided that he needed a new pair of hands to um to sort of galvanise him. And sure enough, Daryl Holland did did click with the horse. He'd been um uh with uh, I think Michael Michael Roberts had most of his glory glory days on him. But um no, Daryl Daryl was on him. Daryl was on him this day, and 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 and, uh, and yes, clearly <laughs> that, he enjoyed that it. Meant quite a lot to him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, great stuff. Uh, double trigger uh, way back um, with that 98 success. Mine, as as we've said, is Frankel. This was 2011. So this was another duel on the downs. It was him against Canford Cliffs. I know the Hannans maintain that um, Canford Cliffs wasn't quite right on the day, 
I mean, I don't think it mattered in the end, did it? But actually, you you mentioned Aussie Jim's commentary. Well, I remember I watched this on the TV. I wasn't there, but I remember Simon Holt just suddenly not quite losing it, but talking about <laughs> Frankel picking up. And Tom Quilly asking the question, then he just had that moment and he just he suddenly went, oh, this is a wonderful horse. And I, I thought that just captured it. Just you almost lost yourself in the performance. It was so electric. And uh, it, that that for me was when, you know, he took on the older horse and he absolutely trounced him. And you just went, uh, I know I know the Guineas was superstar, but that for me was where you went uh, absolutely outrageous. This this mm -hmm. is this is next level stuff. So. Um, that that's probably my my race highlight of anywhere in the world, uh, let alone just at Goodwood. I thought that was a, that was electric. And in the build up, uh, well, of course, Camford Clips have been the, have been favourite, hadn't it? Yeah. You know, it, you know that, that's we we all take Frankel's Majesty for granted now. But you know, before that race, he was um, I think they they flip flopped you know by the by the by the time they finished. But certainly anti post, Frankel was was odds against, and um, and and Camford Clips was favourite. Was that because of the St James's Palace stakes? Yes. The, the yeah. previous one when when Frankel wasn't uh, wasn't that impressive, was he? And uh, yeah, where he was where he was probably ridden to not not you know not all that efficiently ultimately and yeah. nearly cool. But there you are, Mel. You're going for a sprinter. Yeah, I'm going a little bit more recently than than Andy's uh, lovely double trigger. Patash should be my highlight uh, in, in recent seasons, of course. Um, he was absolutely mustard, wasn't he, over uh, the minimum trip at Goodwood, won four renewals of the King George Stakes. And it, it was just brilliant to watch. I mean, we're on quick round, there's, there's nothing better, is there, than a horse that absolutely loves this track, this um, undulating track that, of course, not every horse falls in love with. But Batash, he was simply brilliant. Um, he just you know, burned them all off from the front. And I think as well, his endearing partnership with his groom, Bob Grace, was it was just fantastic, wasn't it? The fact that Batash, you know, one of the fastest horses in the world, would he just walk around the parade ring so genteel like with him. And of course, uh, Bob, um, you know, used to walk at his own sort of pace, and Batash would follow him. And I just think that added to the romance of Batash at, at Goodwood and uh, the fact that he, you know, as soon as Jim Crowley used to unleash Batash. He he was he was you know he showed blistering speed and he actually lowered his own course record when he won the, the King George Stakes for the fourth time. And he really did thrive once he once he'd been gelded, of course. He was a little hot headed and almost got under the stalls at Royal Ascot, didn't he, early on in his career. But uh once um they got him sorted out, he 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 was superb and uh as I said, he, his partnership with his groom, it it was just lovely to see and uh you know, there, there's so much to 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 like about Batash at Goodwood, and um, yeah, he's much missed him in the sprinting ranks. Yeah, I think he was most at home at Goodwood, wasn't he? Uh, four mm -hmm. fabulous performances, the 2018, probably the the pick of them. Dave Yates, where are you looking? Yeah, I had a right few quid on Batash for the listed Windsor Castle Stakes <laughs> uh, as a two-year-old after he'd won at Bath. Let it go, Dave. Let it go. I was, ne I've ne I was never able to enjoy that horse's career because he he went up in the stalls about three times before the Windsor Castle, and they still made him run. And I th and I saw my money go up in smoke. Sorry, Dave. I didn't mean to bring that one back to you. <laughs> you were right, Dave. Weren't you? you got the you know you, you were right. I know you didn't get the pound. You lost your dough, yeah, but you know you had the right. noise of being right. The bills, though, does it? Andy? We've actually we've right. actually got the start to ask it, uh, Dave. <laughs> <for you here. laughs> You you haven't you haven't yeah, yeah. you on a split screen, um, right? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go back to 1992, um, being the oldest member of this quartet uh, for an absolute stirring battle for the Sussex Stakes uh, between Marling and Selkirk and uh, Marling here in the nose band, the Ed Edmund Loader colours, uh, Selkirk also in a nose band, the George Strawbridge towards the outside. Uh, Selkirk had been the winner of the Lockinge, which was then a Group 2, uh, had won the QE2 at Ascot, then run in September in 1991. Marling, narrowly beaten by Hatouf in the, uh, the 1,000 Guineas, then won the Irish version, the Coronation Stakes as well at Royal Ascot, stepping up uh, to take on all genders and also older opposition 
in the Sussex. And I just think that was an absolute humdinger of a horse race. Pat Edry was on uh, Marling that afternoon. And just that wonderful thing in horse racing, uh, which Andy talks about with Double Trigger, where, you know, people sort of say, do horses know that they're racing? Well, it's not speed chess. Of course they know they're racing. And uh, Marling under that Edry drive would not be denied. And the other one, uh, Lady Bothorpe of two years ago, I thought that was one of the most warming results of um, any horse race I've seen in recent seasons. Had been unlucky in the foul mistakes. Um, Kieran Schumark riding that day uh, felt that he should have won. And here, I thought that this was redemption for the horse, for the jockey. Um, Emma Banks, the music agent who has such an infectious love of horse racing, uh, was the owner. And of course, we're used to seeing so many of the sort of behemoth yards and owners um, winning big races like this. This was a wonderful result for William Jarvis to put him back in uh, the Group 1 limelight. So uh, again... To, to report on a race like that, to talk to uh, a, a jockey who had had his first Group 1, an owner who had had her first Group 1 and was delirious uh, with the result, and also a trainer who wasn't having his first Group 1 but was having his first for quite a while. Uh, that was a, a wonderful day that uh, I recall with, with, with great fondness. Lovely stuff. Hope you've enjoyed that trip down memory lane and hope you've made a good note of all the selections that the panel have put up as well on the eve of the Qatar Guru Festival. David Yates, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Tom. Andy Stevens, we'll, um, we'll be hearing from you throughout the week. I, I, I take it, read tips on the website and that's every day. It's a busy week, Tom, isn't it? We've got two festivals for the price of one. Good, just as good would sort of finishes for the day. Way we go again with Galway. So um, it, the, the sport that never sleeps. It's a fantastic, it's a fantastic week. Uh, Melissa Jones, Daily Express Racing Correspondent. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you down there. And hope you've enjoyed it all. We will um, catch you live on Racing TV with day one kicking off on Tuesday of Glorious Good. But let's hope it is. Bye-bye. <laughs>